Hi, I am Dr. Sridhar. Uh, welcome to my channel. Uh, do review the different playlists that are available. And there are playlists for parents as well as playlists for trainees, nurses and uh, different topics are covered. Uh, do share the information, do subscribe if you have not already done so. And uh, thank you for following for those who are already subscribing. Uh, this is a little bit uh, to cover brachial plexus injury. So this is a common question I keep getting asked uh, to make a video on brachial plexus injury. It's a relatively theoretical topic, so bear with me uh, to cover the different aspects of it. Also known as herb Duchenne palsy, it was reported in the 1800s and typically it was involving the upper root level of C5, C6. And we also have Klumke's palsy, which is a lower root C8, T1. And with, when it is extensive involvement of the brachial plexus, it can involve from C5 to T1, which is a total paralysis. Um, I'll be discussing the detail of injury, but uh, the most common mechanisms include stretching, traction, compression, infiltration, and uh, hypoxia. So the most common reason is uh, stretching. Uh, because of the pull on the neck when there is shoulder dystocia. Uh, for those of you who are not totally familiar with what the brachial plexus is, so we have the spinal nerves which arise at each spinal uh, level. We have the uh, cervical spine for each of the uh, cervical vertebra. We have one root coming out. And when the roots come out, they split and uh, there are divisions. Uh, so we have uh, fusion of these to form uh, different levels. So we have the trunk, uh, cord and divisions and uh, they then intermingle and form the nerves. So we, for the upper limb, for example, we have the ulnar nerve, median nerve, radial nerve and axillary and musculocutaneous nerves. So these nerves are formed from merging of these and the sensory and the motor components are mixed differently as well. So uh, you can see here again, we have the C5, C6, C7, and uh, T1 and T2. Uh, usually it's uh, C5 to T1 that is involved. So we have the root of the nerve, and then it uh, divides into trunk of the nerve, and uh, the branches of the nerve finally come out. So the actual nerves are formed at this level, while these are the nerve fibers which get ming mingled. So there is lateral traction on the fetal head, typically when shoulder dystocia impedes the delivery and uh, downward traction causes less stretch. So when you're pulling in line with the spine, there is less stretch than when you're turning the head and pulling, but it depends on the situation, depends on how the head is descending, how the baby is rotating. So the obstetrician needs to decide and manage, but as far as possible, avoid a significant lateral stretch if possible. Uh, uterine anomalies, fibroids, malposition and the nature of contractions can contribute. Uh, it's not necessarily due to excess force by the obstetrician. It can be due to the way the baby is coming out or other factors as I mentioned in the uterus. And it's not always preceded by difficult delivery or shoulder dystocia. It can follow a normal delivery or cesarean section and sometimes antenatal insults are possible as well if there are prominences pressing on the neck of the baby, for example, or stretching due to the position that can contribute as well. So there are different mechanisms of the nerve injury or different grades of the nerve injury. So neuropraxia is mainly stretching and swelling of the nerves and it has a good prognosis. Uh, when there is swelling of the nerve, local damage and possible scarring, uh, there is a local neuroma-like formation and there is uh, the axons may be interrupted. It's called axonotmesis. It's a higher risk of uh, damage, but mostly they improve as well. Neurotmesis, where there is nerve avulsion, there is a higher risk of poor prognosis and we may need surgical repair. And root avulsion at the uh, actual spinal cord level is very severe and poor prognosis and surgery is difficult too. Uh, it's very difficult to localize exactly where the damage is, but if multiple uh, levels are involved, it's more likely at the root level if it's more complete as well. The incidence is variable. It can be 0.1 to 0.3 percent, roughly one per thousand births. And the American uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, did a review on this. If there is shoulder dystocia, 1 to 16 percent is transient and around 1% is persistent at one year. The risk is lower with cesarean section. 
So the risk factors include shoulder dystocia, macrosomia, malposition and abnormal labor. Majority occur in vaginal delivery without shoulder dystocia or other associated risk factors. So it's more common in babies with shoulder dystocia, but if you look at all the Ebb's palsy, then it, um, more of them may happen without a documented shoulder dystocia. So we don't know exactly when the stitch is happening. Uh, the clinical features, majority are unilateral and only 5% are bilateral. I haven't seen any bilateral case till now myself. There are five different patterns. So we have the classic uh, C5, C6 uh, injury or the herbs palsy. This accounts for 50% of the cases. The weakness involves the deltoid and the infraspinatus muscles, mainly the C5 root, and the biceps, which is mainly C6 innervated. The upper arm is adducted and internally rotated. The forearm is extended. The hand and the wrist movement is preserved. Uh, we also have the C5, uh, C6 and C7 injury, which is herbs palsy plus. So this is uh, the next most common with 35% of the cases. It manifests as adduction and internal rotation of the arm, extension and pronation of the forearm, and flexion of the wrists and fingers, sometimes referred to as a waiter stip. So this is a typical uh, waiter stip posture. And obviously this carries a little higher risk of uh, persisting weakness. C5 to T1 injury presents with arm paralysis and some spiring of finger flexion. Uh, severe damage to all the C5 to T1 roots is characterized by a flail arm and Horner's syndrome may be associated because of the involvement of the cervical sympathetic. So you might be familiar with the features of uh, Horner's syndrome, ptosis, uh, meiosis and ophthalmos and the ciliospinal reflex on that side is absent. The C8 to T1 injury which is a true clumpy paralysis, most infrequent pattern and manifests as isolated hand paralysis and Horner's syndrome. The reason this is most uncommon is because to stretch the lower roots uh, without affecting the upper roots is not very common because the way you pull is from the upper level to the lower level. There may be associated lesions like the clavicle and humerus fractures. So most commonly we do x-ray to rule out fractures. We may have shoulder subluxation which is not that common. Cervical spine subluxation is very serious uh, of course but thankfully we don't see that often. And uh, we may have spinal cord injury in which case there will be quadriplegia which is quite poor prognosis and facial palsy is possible as well. So the associated findings happen in less than 10% of the cases. Uh, diaphragmatic weakness or diaphragmatic paralysis due to involvement of the phrenic nerve uh, can happen as well because the phrenic nerve arises from the C3, 4 and 5 uh, roots. Uh, so you may find the diaphragm on the x-ray is up, uh, higher up uh, due to the relative palsy of the diaphragm. So that's one of the things you would see if you're doing an x-ray for the bones, also look at the diaphragm position. The baby's breathing can be seesaw type of breathing or uh, you may not perceive anything immediately. There is also a higher incidence of torticollis because of the stretching of the neck muscles and there may be early speech delay at follow-up. So this is something to monitor. Uh, the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. The arm weakness is perceived at birth. The distribution is consistent with the brachial plexus injury and there may or may not be the history of difficult delivery or shoulder dystocia. We should be very careful when we document in the notes uh, because this is medical legal implication as well. There is clinical examination and radiographic studies for fracture or any other uh, injury and uh, documentation of these uh, injuries is important as well for medical legal reasons. Uh, electrodiagnostic tests, MRI and CT is considered in babies with delayed or poor recovery, usually by two to three months of age. Very rarely they are done in the newborn period unless you have uh, other associated problems. The neurologic examination includes observation of the spontaneous movement, passive and active range of movement, stimulated motor and sensory response, and assessment of reflexes to look for signs of focal or global neurologic signs. Uh, certain postures, uh, typically the weighted tip posture is associated. Asymmetric moro reflex in the newborn examination should uh, arouse suspicion. And I mentioned about Horner syndrome where you have ptosis and uh, meiosis. Uh, and uh, obviously cervical sympathetic involvement is indicated. We may have asymmetric chest cavity expansion and baby may have feeding difficulty or difficulty breathing, which may suggest a diaphragmatic involvement secondary to phrenic nerve injury. 
The early presence of restricted passive range of movement suggests that the peripheral nerve injury occurred in utero or that another musculoskeletal condition is responsible because contracture or joint subluxation will take several months after the nerve injury. So always document these concerns in the beginning. If you see contractures, it kind of absolves the obstetrician of any uh, damage at the time of delivery and it might be an antenatal insult. It may not be able to be clear about what exactly produced it. As I mentioned earlier, it may be swellings in the uterus, the way the baby's position was and so on. But if there are contractures or joint subluxations already, it's unlikely to be at the time of birth. If there is hemiplegia or global neurologic deficit, we should think of a central etiology. So the investigation wise, we need the x-ray to rule out fracture and also to look at the diaphragm as we mentioned. The early EMG or nerve conduction uh, can be considered if you're thinking of possible antenatal injury where there is muscle atrophy or fixed contractures at the time of birth. Uh, MRI is a preferable investigation where we can diagnose root avulsion, uh, neuroma or even pseudomeningocele. It's not very sensitive for the nerve or trunk level lesions. The CT scan needs intrathecal contrast and there is radiation exposure so you may prefer the MRI. Ultrasound can be considered to evaluate a neuroma as well as to look at muscle wasting. And nerve conduction and elect uh, electromyography are considered at later stages as prognostic tool um, before you plan surgery. So the role is not clear cut and obviously these are left to experts to decide. So if you are planning MRA or other uh, investigations, best is to refer to a center who would be considering surgery so they decide what is exactly needed to avoid repetition. In terms of management, physiotherapy after the first five to seven days is key. Refer to them early, but usually the stretching is not done in that period to avoid the risk of swelling aggravated in the beginning by the exercise. So after five to seven days, we start exercising. Passive full range of movement in all the joints. And if there is any risk of contracture, we may consider splinting. Occupational therapy is needed in babies with residual weakness or postural problems to help them counter the weakness and adapt. Most babies with a good prognosis show good progress within three months. I've seen a few babies where till two months, I used to think this baby may not improve well, but then by the third month, they start improving well. So don't feel disheartened if the improvement is slow in the first couple of months. But by three months, most of the time, we see a reasonable improvement, in which case the prognosis is good. And uh, residual weakness is seen in a good proportion, but whether it affects function is the key aspect we should be asking before you send for surgical evaluation. It's not easy, it's not available in many centers, so we need to be thinking carefully, but refer by three to four months if you feel it will be needed. So panplexopathy and uh, <clears throat> preganglionic nerve root lesions, uh, neurotmetic lesions or nerve root avulsions are examples of where you may need surgery. And incomplete functional recovery where there is lack of anti-gravity strength of elbow flexion by three months, or absent or severely impaired hand function at three months in infant with flail arm at birth, or inability of the infant who is older to bring a cookie to the mouth by nine months. So these are all indications that uh, the recovery is incomplete and function is affected, so they will need surgical input. So uh, this is again another uh, reason, inability of the infant to use affected limb to remove a towel uh, by six months of age and uh, reasonably good hand function but a persisting deficit of active wrist extension, weak shoulder elevation and uh, absent shoulder external rotation at six months. These will affect your day-to-day -day routine and uh, posture so it's better to consider treating. So the possible treatments include nerve transfer from the donor intracostal nerves or ulnar motor fasciitis to the fascia to the musculocutaneous nerve to restore elbow flexion and uh, secondary soft tissue shoulder reconstructive surgery to correct the internal rotation contracture could help. And if there is muscle imbalance, botulinum toxin could be used. So these are highly specialized treatments. Only certain centers offer them. Um, better to check in your region who is a treating center. In 88 85%, the improvement is uh, almost full by 18 months in a simple herbs palsy. More extensive lesions have some uh, <clears throat> full recovery rate is lower, 20 to 60%. And most babies with a good outcome show complete a good progress by three months, as I discussed earlier, and complete recovery up to 12 to 18 months. Uh, the EMG and nerve conduction studies at one to three months can help prognostication, but it is not very clear cut whether they do help. 
So uh, I have not discussed uh, the anatomy of the brachial plexus itself in detail because that uh, needs more time and obviously uh, it's enough for us to remember that it is a C5, C6, C7 uh, most of the time and uh, T1 can be involved as well, especially if the hand involvement is there. And remember the weighted tip posture. Uh, don't do physiotherapy for the first uh, five to seven days, but then refer early for physiotherapy. Constant monitoring of the child for progress up to three months, and if the progress is not good with these uh, factors that indicate surgery might help. Uh, refer them to a surgical center. Better wait for the surgeon to decide what investigations will be needed and uh, subsequent. So it's a fairly stressful problem, both for the medical team because the obstetrician is worried uh, and for the parents as well. Uh, many times it's because of the positioning of the baby and or the size of the baby. If you anticipate shoulder dystocia, some obstetricians may offer cesarean delivery to avoid this risk as well. Uh, but it can't always be predicted as in any other problem with obstetrics as well. So uh, with this, I complete this lecture. If you have any comments or questions, please mention. And uh, thank you. Bye-bye.